say it's early winter or late summer afternoon like we have today. My name is Roy Mudd. I'm director of uh, Economic and Community Development here at Thomas Nelson Community College. And it's a pleasure to have you with us today to talk about a very exciting program that we're excited about here and we want to share with you this afternoon. Before we start, there's a few guests we'd like to recognize um, from our General Assembly. Phil Hamilton. Phil, would you stand for a moment? Phil, nice to have you with us. We have some community college board members here from Thomas Nelson, Michelle Dickerson. Michelle, nice to have you with us, Michelle. Frank Yager, Frank. Frank, nice to have you with us. And Betty Timko, Betty. Betty, nice to have you with us. We also have uh, someone who's dear to her heart that serves on the state board for community colleges, Marge Funk. Marge, nice to have you with us. And representing the board of the Thomas Nelson Educational Foundation, uh, John Newman. John, where are you? I saw you earlier. John, nice to have you with us. Bob Schumann, Schufert, Bob. Bob, nice to have you with us. And Hunter Riggins, Hunter. Might be at the restroom. Anyway, <laughs> glad to have you folks with us. <laughs> Today, we're, we've convened uh, this session to talk about a program that we've been working on here at Thomas Nelson with some of our industry partners and our school division partners for the better part of the summer. And we feel very confident that we have a sound program in place that we can uh, put out to you today and give you a chance to, to listen to what we're proposing and to listen to our strategy and to see how we can make this thing work throughout the Virginia Peninsula. Before we get started this afternoon, I would like to introduce the president of Thomas Nelson Community College, Dr. Shirley Pittman, to give you a Thomas Nelson moment. Good afternoon again. I join Roy in welcoming all of you to Thomas Nelson Community College on what I might better describe as this wonderful October afternoon. <laughs> this is a great day to talk about great things in the future of Thomas Nelson Community College and the Virginia Peninsula. I'm just so pleased to see so many representatives of business, education, and government, and the community here with us this afternoon as we take what I think is an important step in addressing the number one priority on the Virginia Peninsula, and that is workforce development. High performance manufacturing and manufacturing excellence are fast becoming the buzzwords used today in talking about successful industry. As we look to the future, it is just so clear that these principles and methods will continue to be the vehicles for growth and development as we do business and compete around the world. If the peninsula is to remain competitive, and I truly believe we will, these strategies must be our way of doing business and our way of preparing our citizens to do business right here at home. This afternoon, you will hear much about this new initiative, and I won't go into detail, but what I'd like to do is to emphasize the partnership ownership that has brought us here today. Partnerships and commitments by entities of higher education like Old Dominion University, by our local public school systems, by our regional education center at New Horizons, and I just left them this morning, by the governmental entities who serve our industries and our workers, and of course by our business and industry partners. The two plus two plus two educational model for high performance manufacturing and training that you will hear about today is one that will stand out around the region and we hope ultimately around the world. But perhaps more important, it is a superb example of the industry, education, and community cooperation that is increasingly becoming the hallmark of how we do business here on the Virginia Peninsula. Again, I welcome you to Thomas Nelson Community College and I look forward to working with all of you to make this project a success. Thank you for coming out. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. What I'd like to do to get us started is give you a little overview of how we went about developing this program. We've been talking about this project now for the better part of uh, two or three years. Um, the project was initially started by one of our engineering faculty here that was since moved on to another organization, Paul Kaufman. So we want to certainly recognize your efforts in this. But we came together and we've been, been talking with a number of diff different constituent groups, talking about how we can come together to develop a model program on manufacturing technology. We soon found in our discussion
discussions that we had uh, several reasons we wanted to convene this group. We were finding that there was a need for highly skilled uh, workforce on the peninsula, and we found there was a requirement to do more specialized training than what we had been doing in the past. So, talking with our partners that Dr. Pippins alluded to earlier, we convened a group consisting of Neither <coughs> Ryan's Regional Education Center, headed up by Dr. Ned Carr, Thomas Nelson, Old Dominion University, working with their engineering, college engineering, and our local industry group. Some of our primary partners in the initial effort here was Canyon, Virginia, Gateway, Siemens, Helmet, the Shipyard, Anheuser Busch, NASA, Microcraft, Ford Marine, and DEI. Since then, we've broadened that group to include about eight or ten different other manufacturing groups who've been coming together and working with us. We wanted to become uh, an entity in which we could develop a regional learning program dealing with manufacturing. There's a number of manufacturing firms throughout our region that had a particular need for uh, particular types of workers. And we were missing the mark in some of our traditional programs. We basically put together a mission statement that indicated that to better serve our manufacturing community, we needed to come together and leverage each other's resources uh, in terms of our programming, in terms of our workforce preparations. We set several goals and objectives. And again, you can look through these as well as I can give them to you. But one goal here was basically to engage, as Dr. Pippins has alluded to, in a regional partnership, bringing together a number of different entities. We also found that we had to have a strategic plan, a strategic vision uh, to deal with our, our new and emerging businesses that were taking place throughout the Virginia Peninsula. And we also wanted to find a way to tap into some of the ex expertise we had throughout the region, leverage those resources to enhance our economic development. We wanted to engage other educational institutions such as Old Dominion University, Hampton University, Christopher Newport, and a number of others, William and Mary along with our public school divisions, to have a seamless educational training program for the manufacturing sector. In doing so, we work with folks at the Virginia Community College System State Office, as well as people from the State Department of Education, uh, as evidenced by Neil Brooks being with us today from the State Department. We also found to accomplish these goals, we needed to come up with a strategy and a model program that we could replicate throughout not only the region, but throughout the state. We've been very fortunate to get some initial seed funding from the Jimmy Community College System, as well as from the State Department of Education to initiate these efforts. And we're looking for other partners, uh, perhaps at the national level, who can help facilitate this project even further. We wanted an area in which workers could also not be employed for entry-level jobs, but for retraining aspects in terms of new opportunities that they may have in their present employment situations. In this partnership, this 2 plus 2 plus 2 program, working at the secondary school division, integrating a manufacturing technology program at the 11th and 12th grade levels. From there, the, the participants can move into the world of work or move directly to a community college program that, that offers certificate and hopefully an associate degree program down the road and here at Thomas Nelson. From there, they can move into the world of work or move directly to a university parallel program at Old Dominion University as well as some other university partners that we've been pursuing. We have a number of different supportive facilities. As you know, you've been reading about in, in the newspaper and, in, and other uh, public relations programs we've been putting together here at Thomas Nelson. We're setting up a workforce development center. Uh, I'm pleased to <coughs> announce that we're pretty close to having our final plans together for the, the, the development and building of a new workforce development center located here on Butler Farm Road in about two years. I'm very pleased, uh, just yesterday, we got approval from the state to initiate an interim workforce development center over at National Language Research Park. So we're moving forward with the program development as we look towards building a permanent workforce development center here on the peninsula. To do so, we have to pull out all of our partnerships and leverage those partnerships as we have with New Horizons, and Ned Carr will share more with you about that in just a few minutes. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. We have our Virginia Community College System represented by Thomas Nelson, our Center for Manufacturing Excellence Center that we're talking about today, our Virginia Quality Institute Network that we've been in, had in place now for the better part of nine years, 
And we also have our Quality Institute itself, which provides a lot of workforce training that is very congruent with what we're doing here in our regular program at Thomas Nelson. And right in the middle of that would be our Workforce Development Center, <coughs> provide that synergism to really develop, develop and deliver these programs. You'll notice in our Workforce Development Center that we're proposing, we have individual services that will be provided, as well as organization services that will be provided. The whole idea is to have one umbrella kind of a one-stop shop location where business industry and individuals as well can go for that training information and hopefully job placement opportunities. At this time, I'd like to introduce an individual that we've been working with that's volunteered his time to come and work with the community college and our partners to help facilitate and pull together this program. Uh, Bill Henderson is a retired NASA executive, and this project has been very close to his heart and we've been very fortunate to have him come and help us with this leadership in this effort. Bill, you can see Bill nursing a, a mad knee.
we've completed phase one of that, uh, and, uh, and, and now we're in the process of phase two and three, which the industry has looked at it, and the other day said that uh, they did meet uh, their needs, and we're here about to uh, the curriculum coming up next. Uh, we're in the process of the uh, partnership establishments, and we're trying to get uh, our writing letters to get people to be on the advisory committee, and then, of course, the implementation of This is what we want the advisory group to do. Uh, we want them to uh, review and evaluate the progress of the programs, uh, maintain partnership uh, in that, assess the degree of implementation, aid in marketing, uh, constantly validate the needs and content of the program, uh, aid in identifying resources. The resources means a lot of things from funding to uh, maybe equipment that could be used internships, co-op programs, whatever it that could be supported. Identifying gaps in training and identify changes in industry needs. This is changing all the time uh, as we go through uh, technologies. <coughs> That's what you go back to the first chart there, Mark. Sure. So that's where we are in this in developing the advisory group the implementation, but I'd like to then now is turn to the curriculum uh, that's to be presented. And the first two, the secondary education, is going to be presented by Mia Carr, the executive director of New Horizon. Uh, the community college will be Dr. Jim Wingo, division chair. Uh, here at Thomas Nelson, <coughs> Mathematics, Engineering, and Technology. And I think for our ODU, we have associate dean of the College of Engineering and Technology, which is Dr. McCree. Uh, that we'll give some comments. That Thank you, Bill. It's been my pleasure to uh, serve on the uh, full committee, the large committee, as we call it. Uh, I want to make a quick note, however, of the fact that, that I simply represent the vocational administrators from the six public school divisions on the peninsula. Um, they, uh, together with teachers, and school board members, and superintendents, have been well informed and involved in this process from the beginning. And so it's been my pleasure to represent them and to work with them as we move forward. Uh, I also want to recognize that in this partnership at the local level, the involvement of the State Department of Education, uh, Niels Brooks, uh, is the uh, director for vocational education at the state level. And he and his staff and the state superintendent has seen the importance of encouraging the development of the kind of workforce educational programs that are necessary for uh, the success of Virginia uh, in this area of high technology manufacturing. Uh, the state has been very active, and our recent governors have been very active in recruiting industry to the state seems only reasonable that they at the same time to support the development of the kind of infrastructure and education systems that we need to ensure that those businesses are successful. And so they've been a, a, an active partner and participant in this process as well. And I'd also like to, to recognize uh, both Rob and Ruth, who is a, an employee at Cannon, Virginia, and Pat Kanopnicki, who's the vocational administrator from Virginia Beach, who's here today as well. Uh, because, in, in, at least in our minds, at the secondary school level, a lot of this goes back to some conversations we had riding back from Richmond, Virginia in, uh, in February about the fact that, yes, we needed to encourage legislators like Phil Hamilton and others to continue to support educational education at the same time we're supporting strong academic programs, but also that local education systems needed to take a look at the new uh, needs of local industry in the manufacturing area and be responsive to those, those programs. And Pat had some great ideas that, that got us started and uh, of course Robin was, was very forceful in, in assisting us in that process. So very important players. Uh, I just have a few slides. I passed out a, a more in-depth handout that probably was not adequate for the number of people who are here today, but we'll make those available for those of you who are interested uh, to take a look at the secondary component. 
Uh, this slide simply reinforces what you've heard, but I would like to say again that this is a true consortium of industry and education. And uh, we have been talking, I know Thomas Nelson has, and, and Old Dominion as well, about our desire to be responsive to industry needs. Uh, this is a pure example, a pure model of that uh, in this best form. Basically, if you have been uh, living in Virginia very long, more than a week, you are aware that we are uh, experiencing a rather significant uh, period of educational reform. And people, whether they like it or not, are becoming very familiar with acronyms like SOL and SOA and SOQ, and it goes on and on. Uh, but the standards of learning are essentially a state curriculum. The state of Virginia has defined what it is that they believe young people should know and be able to do. And the primary thrust of that is in the core academic subject areas. Um, as a consequence of that, in addition also to the accountability system that the State Board of Education has put in place that requires students to take end of course tests to demonstrate their ability to master the core academic subjects. The daily schedules of students, annual schedules of students, are very tight in terms of the courses that they can take. So the, the task that our committee had to face was how can we meet industry needs and at the same time recognize the demands of higher academic standards in Virginia. So we basically uh, came up with a two-pronged approach, which was a series of prerequisite courses in addition to a primary comprehensive course, which we're calling Integrated Systems Technology. This is a one-year course, 396 hours of instruction and application, three elective credits for students, and it can be taken, as you see, in the 11th and 12th grade uh, years. It'll be uh, established at New Horizons. For those of you who are not familiar, New Horizons is a regional education center owned and operated by the six public school divisions. We have a what we call a shared time program in the sense that students come to us for part of their day and then go back to their home school for the rest of their day. Usually their academic subjects are taken at their home school and they can come and take career and technical education programs at New Horizons. So this would be such a program offered in the, either the 11th or 12th grade year. It would be a two-hour, 20-minute course per day, five days a week. And it would emphasize a broad range of skills uh, for those students, which I'll hit in a minute. The prerequisite courses would be fundamentals of technology, basic technical drawing, and computer applications. So the students would have to have that as background in addition to their core academic subjects. The objectives of our course uh, would be as follows, to improve academic skills in mathematics, science, language arts, and social studies. Let me make it clear, vocational education is going to continue to exist in Virginia. It's got to do those things that we believe it can do. And that is motivate youngsters to focus on a, a goal and to understand the importance of their core academic subjects to accomplish that goal. Some of us uh, surely alluded to a meeting with um, the Leadership Institute of the Chamber of Commerce over the Horizons this morning. We had uh, up and coming leaders in our community and they were learning about education and we, uh, I learned a lesson once again, I've learned it two or three times and mentioned it, I'm going to really learn it. And that is that rather than have me come and talk to any group about our programs, it's much better to bring students and have them talk about the program and how much it means to them. We had a panel of five vocational students who are in various programs at New Horizons. And that very question was asked, what impact has this program that you are so happy to have had back in your home school and your four academic subjects? And every one of them said that it gave meaning to their educational efforts. They understood why it was necessary to do well in mathematics, science, social studies, and language arts. And as a consequence, they were doing better in their courses as a result of their vocational programs. So 
Clearly, that's one of the objectives of what we're doing and the first objective. The second is to enhance technical skills through hands-on experiences in the following areas. Design processes, manufacturing processes, quality assurance, automated material systems, and robotics, fluid power systems, and electrical systems control. Again, this is a, a different course than we usually teach uh, in, in the trade and industrial area. It's a much, broad, much broader based course. It gives students lots of different exposures and hands-on application, which is very significant. Um, this again is driven by what industry has said to us, where their needs are, what they have, what they're looking for, a new entry level employees. Don't put too fine a point on the training. Give them a broad exposure. The final slide simply says, another objective is to improve interpersonal skills, resource management, workplace ethics, like completing team-oriented activities and projects. One of the things that one of the members of uh, the uh, group from the Chamber of Commerce said to me today is, you know, you have a panel of career and technical students and a panel of, of governor school students. The governor school students are the top academic students in the six school divisions that we serve. You know what, the, what struck the person who came up to me was? that the presentation confidence level of the vocational students was equal to the government school students. That's really excellent because that's what we point towards. We teach kids how to make presentations, how to stand on their feet and present the information that they have. And as a consequence, they have that confidence, those people skills, communication skills, they're also critical parts of this program. And finally, we want to reinforce all of this through industry-supported summer internships uh, to reinforce key uh, skill areas that, that we will be emphasizing in the course. Uh, this is very, very important. This will be, you know, in a very limited sense, a summer job for students, but what it really is is an opportunity to see what the real world is like, see how they measure up, see what the requirements are, and really get a taste of what's going on in, in the world. It's a vitally important process, and we'll be looking for our industry partners to assist us in accomplishing that because that's something we can't do uh, back in the, uh, the uh, secondary schools, either in the high schools or in our uh, vocational center. <coughs> so that gives you an overview. Again, there's more detailed information in the handout that I passed out, and uh, if someone would like a copy of that, uh, to get more detail, I'll be happy to provide it uh, after this meeting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Gene Winko, Chairman of the Science, Math, Engineering, and Technologies here at Thomas Nelson Community College. Um, I think uh, it's important, first of all, for me to acknowledge those people and colleagues of mine who work uh, on this committee, the subcommittee, to develop this curriculum. And you see their names on the uh, on the screen. Ned Carr, of course. Uh, and Kurt Strobing from the Horizon Regional Education Center. We asked Paul Kaufman and Dr. John Ritz to uh, sit with us from ODU. Bruce Little and Garland Reese are here today and, and uh, they represented NASA. Uh, Roger Lemaster is our uh, program director here for uh, AutoCAD. And uh, Mark Watson, of course, did all the real work and he's the head of our electronics program here at Thomas Nelson. Now we had two goals, two major goals when we met. We met four times and uh, met for an hour and a half to two hours at a setting. And we first developed a uh, conceptual model in which to work. And our job was to develop a program for the community college that would be sandwiched between the secondary program represented by New Horizon and the university. In this case, we chose the Old Dominion University to come in with us and talk to us about this because we've had such an effective uh, transfer relationship with Old Dominion for some 30 years. Uh, we have, we've sent uh, our graduates to their bachelor's degree program in technologies for uh, 30 years now and have had a great relationship with them. We hope that all universities four-year schools in this area will be a part of this partnership eventually. Um, this conceptual model 
that we came up with is a, is a building block on certificates here at Thomas Nelson. The, uh, the salaries we, we came up with uh, just yesterday from one company. <laughs> and uh, so we'll have to uh, review and, uh, and revise those probably. But the idea was that we'd use this as a marketing tool and that it would demonstrate that the more you learn, the more you earn concept of students and parents. And uh, this program, of course, that we've developed is based upon certificates. <coughs> and uh, this is a certificate, this, this, and then this additional part is the associate degree courses. Uh, that's all in your handouts. Um, and uh, maybe we need to talk, turn to the next page because it's uh, a little better description of the uh, certificate. We first of all felt like we had a certificate here at Thomas Nelson called High Performance Manufacturing that we should build on. <coughs> and, uh, and that program has 53 graduates as of today. Uh, those graduates are primarily people that work at uh, Siemens Automotive that are in their paper knowledge program there and we teach courses on, their campus, uh, on our campus for them and on their workplace. Uh, in addition to that, we decided we would develop a certificate program that would build upon that. And so, in addition to the four courses that you see on the left-hand side, IND 181, Drafting 160, Math 105, which is a basic math course with uh, fundamental geometry and trigonometry, and IND 140, which is a quality control course. <clears throat> we would build upon that and develop a new certificate program. And that certificate program, program we would call Electrical Mechanical Assembler. And it would add those courses that you see in the middle <clears throat> column right here. Have those courses at the bottom of the page. MEC 113, Materials and Processes of Industry, Introduction to Metrology, uh, Shop Practices and Safety, etc. And then we would add these courses on the right hand column. You may see 131, Drafting 125, so on. And all together, those courses would make up a one-year certificate program with a total of 36 credits, semester hours. The MAC course is a machine labs course. The DRF 125 is our smart cam course. We'll be offering that in our interim workforce development center, uh, hopefully starting in January, February of 1999. Uh, the uh, Faculty Curriculum Committee at Thomas Nelson Community College has approved these two additional certificates and uh, we expect to implement them in the fall of 1999. Now, the additional pages, uh, the next six pages, as a matter of fact, is uh, a bit redundant because it just shows how, the next three pages shows how those certificates will be laid out in the catalog. Page four, for instance, is our high performance manufacturing technology program and the courses that apply, and so on. The next two pages have to do with the career study certificate in electrical mechanical assembler, and then certificate in advanced manufacturing technology. And those courses all add up to 36 credits, and that's essentially for a full-time student a one-year certificate program. Now, the next page, page seven. What I've tried to do here is to, to select keywords and phrases so that for a quick read you can see what is in these courses. Uh, and every one of the courses on the next two pages are those courses that make up those two certificate, those three certificate programs. So you have uh, blueprint reading and math and quality control, uh, introduction to metrology at the bottom of the page safety practices, fundamental circuits course, machine lab, computer-aided machining, 
and a n- number of technical electives. And then we have to add on orientation, practical writing, and computer science to meet the PCCS requirements, the Virginia Community College System requirements. Now, in, in the conceptual model, what we've said is that we will add courses onto those three certificate programs and develop an associate degree program. And our implementation deadline for that is the fall of 2000. Uh, the addition of four courses for the associate degree program are drafting 151 and then a computer aided drafting sequence 231 to 32, electrical mechanical systems and principles of robotics. And then we add human humanity, social science, and an additional higher level math course, 115, 116. The next page, page 10, outlines that complete associate degree, which we will try to implement in the fall of 2000. Now, that is our program. So the first goal was to craft an associate degree built upon these concepts. So we, we completed that. The, the next goal was to validate what we've done, to find out if this is really meet, it's what the industry says they want. Is this it? Now we'll never know that until our students go out to work and they give us feedback that says, yes, you're sending us the students that we want. They do make their workers go on. So we tried to validate what we had put together. One way we did this was to compare it to an associate degree program in another community college in the day. And secondly, we reported back to the, the, the larger committee and got positive feedback. Uh, the third thing we're going to do is uh, next <coughs> week a team of six people including secondary people in community college, people will visit the National Science Foundation's Manufacturing Excellence Center at Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio, where Sinclair Community College and the University of Dayton have a 2 plus 2 arrangement. And they are the NFL Manufacturing Center of Excellence in the United States. So we will visit uh, that particular program and, and match what they're doing compared to what we have planned and adjust accordingly. The fourth way we tried to validate this was that we were given an integrated manufacturing technology mo- module, which came, I believe, from Neil Brooks. Um, and the good thing about that was that it had all the competencies listed out. So what we tried to do was to see if those competencies were, competencies were included in our program that we had planned. So you see a matrix that we developed with those competencies across the top. And those courses from Thomas Nelson's program, or planning program, down the left-hand column. And we checked off where there was correspondence. And if you look through that whole thing, it's actually two sheets in your handout. If you look at that whole thing, you'll see that all of the competencies are covered by the time the person gets to associate degree. Now, that is our program. Uh, we certainly would welcome uh, questions and comments or concerns before you leave today. Um, the, uh, the next step, of course, is working with universities. We expect to be working with Hampton University, Christopher Ford University, and especially with Old Dominion University because uh, that's where our students have transferred for the most part. Uh, Old Dominion has worked along with us because they have some programs, and we feel that it's very realistic to think that students can continue this kind of a program at ODU in their engineering technologies division or their bachelor's degree in occupational technical studies. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. McCree to come up and say a few words from Old Dominion University. Thank you. Thank 
Thank you, Gene. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm substituting for uh, Dr. William Swart, those of you who are following your agenda. Uh, maybe those of you who met uh, Bill will be able to tell that because I'm the one with hair. <laughs> Bill is distinguished by his uh, glow. Uh, I, that reminds me, uh, the first place I ever taught, the faculty got rather large in some of the departments, so they appointed associate department heads, head department heads, they appointed associate department heads. Well, it wasn't long before the faculty were referring to the two gentlemen, the, the department head and the associate head, as the head and the not head. <laughs> so if you'd like, I'm, I'm the not dean. <laughs> I also answer the not head, by the way, as my wife and children uh, know very well. I think this is a great program, and, and let me say right off the bat, I had very little to do with it being uh, put in place. But there are some people here from Old Dominion University uh, who did, and I, I want to again recognize, well, one's already been recognized a couple of times, he must be very significant in this whole program, and that's Dr. Paul Kaufman there. I remember Paul first when he was here and I was there and we worked together on a number of programs and now we feel very lucky that he's with us. But I think his feet are still firmly planted here on the peninsula and because we've got him uh, maybe uh, this program will work better than if we did not. The other one that is here from our faculty is Dr. Uh, Berman who is uh, in our mechanical engineering technology department and will be very instrumental in developing our part of this program. Uh, <clears throat> let me say, you know, I, I'm a substitute here, kind of a last minute substitute, but I'm very impressed with what I hear and see. Um, I know and I'm, I'm glad to hear that people are mentioning the long and productive relationship we've had with uh, TNCC. Uh, we feel that the graduates that we send out into the world who have begun in the community college system are some of the best that we have. And I think this integration, this vertical integration, that now reaches into the high school level, which I'm very impressed with because I've always felt that that disconnect we impose on our students between high school and college is a very difficult one. It's almost destructive in some cases. And everything we can do to improve that is a great step in the right direction uh, in education in general. And, and this is one of those steps. Maybe this can be sort of a model that other programs can look at. So, so that's one thing that you're definitely to be commended for. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to see it. Uh, we, of course, have had great success with our community college students, as I've mentioned. Uh, and we are very happy to see that ongoing. It is growing so greatly, as much as anything else, because of our teletechnic program, I guess, that uh, well over half of our graduates in the technology programs uh, began their uh, career in community colleges. Uh, Teletechnet is, is causing that statistic to become greater and greater and greater all the time. Uh, and of course, we're dealing with community colleges across the state, and the technology has allowed us to have relationships with them that are almost as good as those we have now and have had for years with places such as Thomas Nelson. I think this is uh, uh, going to mean a uh, this will be a great advantage for all the students that are able to find their way into these kinds of programs. Um, I just came from a meeting uh, talking about technology and, and improvements in education. I just came from a meeting which was conducted by members of our technology faculty and we invited uh, the provost and vice president of finance and others from the university to come over and see a presentation by several members of our faculty as to how they are using the internet to deliver their education. Uh, using off-the-shelf software. Software that has only recently, uh, 
there are several pieces of software that have recently been put together uh, under the ownership, I don't know whether it's good or bad, of IBM, who now owns Lotus, and uh, Lotus has bought some other companies that have put together some software that allows these faculty members to teach to anyone sitting anywhere at a desktop computer, not requiring any expensive hardware or even expensive software, and to do so as effectively as in the classroom. At least that's our initial response from the students. This includes laboratories. Now, you know, uh, people wonder about this. Can, can this really be? And I don't know that I have the answer. I'm not sure that any of us have the final answer on this. Uh, but they are doing it now, and they are doing it very effectively. Uh, the professor was showing, he teaches um, uh, digital systems and, and the uh, uh, really computer engineering technology. He teaches students how to put together a computer. And of course, this involves physical wiring of parts together. So how do you do that when you're trying to do it over the internet? Using nothing more sophisticated than the student's browser. Now, not, not expensive software, but the same thing you use to buy a book from Amazon.com. The student is using to get a degree. The student can take the circuit that he's working on, hold it in front of a camera, and live with the professor be questioned and tested as to whether or not he really knows what he's doing with that system. Uh, it's just mind-boggling to think what we can do. And it's not really in the future. It's here now. I saw it at 11 o'clock before I came over here and the provost saw it, and the vice president from finance saw it, and they said, good for you, let's go, and we will. And these people who are now coming here and, and uh, are in New Horizons down the street, or wherever they may be, at their workplace, they will be able to receive this education and eventually get a degree. So. Uh, Yesterday I was at the, uh, in Williamsburg at the Governor's Commission for Information Technology. We're one of those government bodies that's going to solve everybody's problems. Well, this is a pretty good one, I guess. And uh, I, I uh, heard uh, Bill Schrader, who's the CEO of uh, PSINet, which is one of the original internet providers, talk about the fact that he's getting ready to build a new communication center which will employ maybe 500 uh, high-tech employees. That's great. His, his headquarters is in Northern Virginia. Uh, everyone at the meeting, including the congressmen and everybody in the legislators, were all saying Virginia is at the forefront of information technology, which is true. Uh, we, the entire world, we have a corner on more internet dollars in this state than anyone else. But he said, I've got to build a new communication center, and I'll employ about 500 people. And I'm building it where I need to build it, and it is not in the state of Virginia. And the only reason is because he cannot hire the people he needs. Now, this is a, a, an information technology company, not a manufacturing company. We are very lucky that maybe not lucky, smart is a better word, I suppose, that we have Motorola, Siemens, IBM, all these people bringing their electronic manufacturing facilities here. That's great. It's just begun to happen. The same thing happened in the information technology industry 10 years ago. We must be sure that the bill of traders of the future who are in electronic manufacturing business don't decide to put a plant somewhere else because Virginia can't provide them with the high-tech workers they need. And this program is certainly one that will help to see that doesn't happen. So I just 
wind up, by the way, you're lucky, I'm a last minute substitute, I have no slides. Uh, I will just wind up saying congratulations not only to my people that are here, but to all of you who have worked hard to put this program together. Uh, it could be one that will save the future of manufacturing in the state of Virginia. An awful lot of our children and grandchildren will thank you for it, although they probably don't know who you are. But uh, let's hope it prospers and does as well, and that our relationships uh, between community college and ODU continue to grow. And uh, thank you all very much for your attention and all your hard work in the past.
High school graduates still make up the backbone of the American labor force, particularly in manufacturing. Interesting, isn't it, that a magazine, a business magazine of this caliber would take so much time to evaluate the effectiveness of local high schools. And that's because, of course, industry executives from all over the country understand that there is, in fact, a gap between what happens in Boquette around the country and what happens in industry. Consider also the findings of J.D. Hoy and Stephen Trigger, as reported in their recent article, Redesigning U.S. Education for the 21st Century. Point one, more than 50% of employers say that they cannot find qualified applicants for entry-level positions. Point two, by the year 2000, only 12% of American jobs will be unskilled, down from 60% in 1950. Point three, one-third of all high school graduates fail to find stable employment by the time they're 30 years old. The authors go on to say that American industry, still the most productive in the world, can keep the upper hand in global competition only by developing workforce. And here's another quotation from the same article. This means developing workplaces that need highly skilled workers to create products that are better than those of third world and other global competitors. So what does the new American manufacturing worker need to look like? What knowledge and skill sets do they need in order to prosper and survive? What do they need to pursue? The hardworking industry subcommittee of this group that focused on this very question came up with the following list. Total quality management, blueprint reading, mechanical reasoning, Critical thinking skills, such as decision-making, problem-solving, evaluation, and the ability to follow instructions. Teamwork, math skills, communication skills, computer literacy, and workforce readiness, including punctuality, honesty, and interpersonal skills. And above all, knowing how to learn and becoming a dedicated, lifelong learner are critical qualities for anyone seeking or keeping employment in today's high-speed roller coaster style of employment. It's fascinating how many times we hear the same story from so many different people. Last February, Dr. Robert Templin, <coughs> most of you know him, is now the president of Virginia's Center for Innovative Technology in Herndon, Virginia, offered a similar list during a presentation in Hampton. He referred to the higher order skills vital to 21st century workers. And they include learning to learn, creative problem solving, teamwork, leadership, critical thinking, project management, and communication skills. The December 1998 issue of the Futurist magazine offers a list of skills for workers of the most sophisticated and successful corporations of the future. This list includes technical skills, number one. Numbers and measurement capabilities, organization skills, communication skills, and the always present ability to learn. We don't need to look very far to find an example of how these skills are utilized in manufacturing. If you haven't toured Canon, Virginia recently, my own company, you may be surprised to know that our non-automated assembly lines are disappearing. Production is quickly changing from conveyor assembly to cell assembly. This new production system, known internally at Cannon, Virginia Incorporated as NPS, requires that individual members work in very close association with their neighbors in the assembly of whole printer subunits, and eventually whole printers. In essence, we're going back to the future in order to recreate the notion of a single craftsperson building an entire unit. Why? Why are we undoing the brilliant and revolutionary work of Henry Ford and the assembly line method of production? Under this new system, we can save production space, boost efficiency and productivity, and reduce the amount of production machinery required. But more important, we want to empower our members with greater autonomy, greater responsibility, greater decision-making capacity, greater accountability for their work, 
and greater freedom over the way that work is done. By eliminating the tyrannies of the belt-driven assembly line and the repetitive, non-thinking motion that they all had to do so frequently, we intend to create a more dynamic work environment that will re-energize and renew our members. We need them to think. We need their input. We need them to be involved in their work. In short, we need them to be fully engaged in their work processes as they carefully and hopefully proudly assemble their business machine units. Is this radical transition an easy one for them? Obviously not. Do we have to invest in lots of training, time, energy, and dollars? Yes. And will it work for everyone? Probably not. But the rest of the manufacturing world is moving in this direction, or it has already arrived. Does Canon Virginia want to be left behind in this global competition? Emphatically not. So we transition, we train, and we hastily move forward. Obviously, our new system of production requires workers with the skill sets that I described above. We cannot use the automaton who wants a non-thinking job. We need highly skilled people, even though probably fewer than 20% of our 2,000 plus members at Canon Virginia require four-year degrees in order to perform their jobs. This is why industry needs the services provided by the kind of program we just heard about. If American students and American industry are to remain competitive well into the future, we have to do a better job at getting our young people ready to go to work. Furthermore, the task will be successful only if we all cooperate. The job is too big, too complex for just educators or just industry to tackle. For example, work-based learning activities such as internships and cooperative internships are excellent ways to introduce employees or future employees to the real world of work. In this regard, I'm reminded of the slogan that all of us associate with our local Achievable Dream Academy. Quote, education is everybody's business. Unquote. All of us know what we want our young workers to look like, behave like, and work like. Now we have a vehicle that can help us help them to look, behave, and work like the people that manufacturers need. If we are successful, the phrase <coughs> vocational excellence will no longer be an oxymoron. And if we're really lucky, perhaps fun homework will be soon behind. Thank you. Center board at Whitfield Community College, which is one of the three centers 
uh, for manufacturing excellence. John Tyler is the other. We are very fortunate as a trade association to have members like Siemens and Canon and the Shipyard and Almet and Anheuser-Busch and Ball and Reynolds Metals and Ford. <coughs> These people are the ones who are leading the way. We act as a conduit and a catalyst to share their information with our other members throughout the state mm -hmm. and to energize them so that they replicate what works for them having borrowed it from past successes. You know, we're primarily lobbyists. And that means we're the folks you hire to protect you from the folks you elect. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, we'll probably be in business for an awful long time. We've been around for 75 years. This was an issue that came about because all of our members were having the problem. It didn't matter whether it was Electrolux in Bristol, or the shipyard here, or national fruit products in Winchester. Everybody was having the same problem. The first thing what folks want, though, in addition to the hard skills that have been talked about here this morning, this afternoon, is integrity. A worker who has no integrity and won't show up for work, no matter how good their skills are, is worthless to you. If you've got a cell operating in Canon, putting together copiers and printers, and that's six people, and two of them decide not to come to work today because it's too nice and they're going to go fishing, the other four folks have got a real problem. Either somebody from an earlier shift is going to have to stay over, or production quotas aren't going to be met. Chaparral Steel is building a new facility outside of Petersburg. Before they interview people, they test them. And the first test they give them is for attitudes. If they don't have a good attitude, they don't go any further in the process. As the number of people on the work floor shrinks because of automation, because of smart manufacturing, we become more and more dependent upon those who are there. <coughs> The other thing is, as Jack mentioned, is they must have a desire and the skills to learn for the rest of their life. When this country was founded, when folks settled at Jamestown, four generations could use the same technology. Lifespans were shorter, technology lasted longer. We are now living longer, and technology has a life cycle of 18 months to three years. Consider that you're going to be working for 40 years between the time you're 21 and 62 when you get to retire, which is a fantasy I don't think will ever happen for me. <laughs> I have two kids in tuition situations, so. <laughs> but this, you're going to go through 15 to 30 technologies in your lifetime alone. My grandfather was a blacksmith. In his lifetime, we put a man in space. Think what that means for us, having grown up with a man in space. What's it going to do in our lifetime? Where are we going to be? We have to have the skills to learn the new skills. Finding information. VMA chose to adopt and, and promote a product called Work Keys from ACT. We like to refer to it as a, an entrance exam for the job. We liked it because it had two components. One component is the standardized metric, much like the SAT or ACT college entrance exam. The other was an actual profile done in the job site of the skills needed to do a specific job for a specific employer. I'm not done talking to the HR folks, because quite honestly, what they think happens on the floor and what's really going on aren't even on the same planet most times. And uh, if you're in HR, I, I probably owe you an apology, but um, that has been most of the experience that we've encountered. They actually sit down with people who do the job and through a very ordered process go through and develop a skill set, reading for information, communications, applied mathematics, applied technology. 
the skill levels of those very items you needed to do a job. Now, when a, a student comes out of school, and in Tennessee, you can take one of three tests to get out of high school, ACT, SAT, or work keys. It's now accepted in Tennessee. They can show up at your door with their skill sets quantified for you, much like when you apply to a college. DuPont and Richmond is using them in a rather unique way. They pre-screen applicants for entry-level jobs using work keys. If you don't measure up, you get a letter that says you didn't make it. Now that's where the letter used to end. You didn't make it. But now they are referred to the community college, to someone skilled in work keys, in this case Jack Kessler, who then will sit down with them, go over their profile, go over the profile of the job they've applied for, show them where they are short in matching that profile, and then work with them to develop the courses at the, at the community college that they can use to fill those gaps. <coughs> and the last paragraph of the letter says, when your profile matches what we're looking for, please come back. They are not looking to run people off. They're looking to bring the people in who are a qualified pool of job applicants. Not to send them away into the darkness. This is a really interesting approach now. You know, you mentioned, Jack, what, 20 so jobs that are non-skilled? We have a manufacturer in Richmond. If you want to push a broom and clean the plant, you must be both literate and computer literate. Because the cleaning crews communicate with each other via email. So to push a broom, you have to be able to use a computer. Now the good news is the broom is Y2K compliant. They've already checked it. <laughs> That's maybe where the third world has us, you know. 2001, they're going to make, you know, the shovel still works. What did you need done? <laughs> this sledgehammer will still break up your old computer. <laughs> it is a very big issue for us, and it's an issue of competitiveness long term. Manufacturers have had to rely on technology to fill the void when the skilled workers weren't there. The problem with that solution is that it works in the short term, but it widens the gap between the available workforce and the skills they need to enter that workforce in the future. What is being done here, and I'm going to ask Jack if Canon will do an article for AMA Focus, which is our quarterly magazine. We're going to be doing another themed issue on education. You know, it's funny, when I got to him, we mentioned to our president about education being an issue. His eyes would glaze over and he'd sort of roll back in his head. And he was a lawyer. And we, but he defines himself as a recovering attorney. And sometimes he starts writing long sentences and we put him back in the 12-step program. <laughs> but he, he's, he's pretty much staying on the way. He's now converted. He's almost like the converted drunk who wants everybody else to get on the wagon with him. It is a big issue, and it's an issue for the long term. We're going to share what's being done here with other folks around the state so that our members who are in other portions of the, of the state can borrow from it and replicate it in their own community. This is wonderful. This will allow workers to stop at any point along that continuum that is appropriate for them. They may not have the desire to go on to the you. They may only want a certificate. But that is their option. You have created an, a continuum of education that holds it for them, promise for the future, should they choose to reach out and grab the price ring. I'm glad to see Richmond represented here. I live in Richmond, which is one of those odd things. I was actually born there. <laughs> Fancy you behaving today? <laughs> I appreciate the invitation, Roy, and it's really exciting, and I'm looking forward to seeing it go into place. Thank you. Again, I'm Roy Tom Bell, he's been working in some partnerships with our Top Energy Council now for about 10 years. Rex Kettler is our uh, job profiler, and uh, we've been working with him, and we're supposed to be on that. We've got some pretty good data to put together thus far. Uh, our last speaker of the evening, and I know it's been kind of a long program, but I think it's an important program, is someone at, from the national level, representing the national level in terms of being back in the workforce.
development. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that the National Association of Manufacturers does have a division of workforce uh, development. And the person that heads up that division, the executive director for the Center for Workforce Success, is Ms. Phyllis Eisen. And Phyllis is with us today with one of her colleagues, and we're glad to have you in our community and our state. And we look forward to a few remarks from you, Phyllis. Thanks. And I promise it'll be very few. And I am standing up. <laughs> if you wanted to know, following all these tall guys. Uh, I, I do appreciate the invitation today, and all I can say is, wow, this is an extraordinary partnership and um, coalition you formed. And I, like all coalitions, it has some strange bedfellows to it, because they don't work unless you bring everybody else in. And I'm sure I haven't seen everybody that's in the partnership, but I know how difficult they are to put together. But in the long run, they're even as hard to keep together. So I wish you well. And I hope, since alliances and partnerships are going to be the name of the game for the NAM for the 21st century, only we're starting now, trying to get a, a, a leg up here, that you'll continue to work. You'll work with us and help us share what you've done around the country with our members. How many people know anything about the National Association of Manufacturers? Now, that's a goodly number. Just to, so you can know, we're a horizontal trade association. Uh, lucky to have affiliates such as the Virginia Manufacturers Association uh, as well. We have 14,000 members from all manufacturing uh, elements, uh, including industries that serve manufacturing, such as banking and insurance. And the majority of our companies are small and medium size which we, uh, our number is 500 or fewer. We have all the large companies, most of them, that, that you would expect, including some you might not want to expect, that you might not expect, like Disney and McDonald's. Manufacturing is the place to be today. The average wage is about $46,000, and you can go up to $100,000 with overtime. That's a pretty good life. That's a pretty great way to live. Why is it then that so few people, young people in particular, want to go into manufacturing? Because it's not just having all the elements in place of what the right, what the correct employee, manufacturing worker, the 21st century should look like, and God knows, as everybody said very clearly, the skills bar has gone way up. It's just amazing. But if I honestly asked you all to raise your hands, and tell me how many of you want your children to be factory floor workers? How many of you would say that? <laughs> Honestly. Okay, good. That's about the uh, answer I get around the country and around the world, by the way. When I travel through Europe and other parts of the world, it's the same thing. Yes, it's true. 70% of our young people do not go through and get a four-year degree. Particularly not right away. The numbers are increasing. Dramatically, because of course the high schools and many universities hear what the parents are saying, because the parents are reading the poll, the, the literature that says how much money you make more, make more money over your lifetime if you have a four-year degree. So they're pushing them in, but they're not all coming out the other end, and they're certainly not coming out with the skills that you so, um, I think, brilliantly laid out. I've spoken at many community colleges, and many community colleges association over the last few years, and it has taught me a lot of things, just as being here today has taught me a lot. I thank you. I don't go anywhere where I don't learn something. And that is, in the community college system itself, there's a lot of conflict going on as to which part of the community they really are uh, there to represent. Is it the future workforce? Is it their university? Where do they fit their credit courses and their non-credit courses? What about adult learners? What about lifelong learning? Where really we have all the words, we just don't all know the way to integrate them yet. And that's why I celebrate and came down here today to, to say good for you for what you're doing in linking your high schools, your community colleges, and your universities, and God willing, we'll all get a little bit smarter about preparing people for high-skilled jobs, because we're in a choice period now, and the window's not that wide open. 
It's high skills, high wages, or low skills, low wages. That's it. And we know we cannot live, continue to have the kind of country we've all prospered in with a low skill, low wage economy. We can't let manufacturing go. And yet it will. There is no question it will move to where the people are the smartest. Because the tech, it's a technolog technological revolution. Oh, we all know that. This is very old news. We now need the smart people to run the smart machines. And everybody's got the smart machines. Huts in Bangladesh. Wherever you go. So we have no choice to do this. I'll tell you, it's not working that well across the country. There is a lot of confusion and anxiety, and particularly in smaller companies that really feel they're on the sort of fuzzy end of the lollipop. They haven't had the money all these years to do the kind of training they need. They're anxious. More and more is being outsourced to them by the larger companies. Larger companies are demanding so much of their smaller suppliers. And they don't know where to get these workers. And you're right, I don't know who was talking about it. the poaching and the stealing that's going on. Everybody's stealing each other's workers. That's the way it's done now. The community colleges, the high schools, and universities are now our only answer. And I urge you in your, in your extensive um, curricula here to make sure that there are, along with all the technical courses, that there are also the critical thinking courses the problem solving courses, all that is interwoven. I'd like to add another one, information handling. I want to take that, so would you please have that so I can come and take it. All of us are drowning. We're drowning in emails, we're drowning in voicemails, we're drowning in everything. We have to teach people who are going to be, have the job of the future how to handle this information, how to read a spreadsheet, how to understand the financials. They can't have the ownership in the com company if they don't have that, and yet we still have 30% of our workforce is workforce illiterate. That means they can't read the OSHA signs on the wall that tell them what they need to do to be safe. Pretty scary. So who knows? The jobs may have to go to Georgia and the former Soviet Union, where they have 98% literacy rate and are desperate for jobs. 98 and more engineers per square foot than we have lawyers per square foot in Washington. You know we've got a lot of those. Uh, so I leave you that as a challenge. Not as a dead, but as a real challenge. We've got to get to the parents to tell them about manufacturing so they'll pay for the courses, the associate degree that you've got in your school, so they're not going to write the check. That's what I heard around the country. Well, this sounds very good, but no one's going to write a check. They want to come in and get pre-law, or they want to get pre-this or pre-that. Somehow we have to make that manufacturing associate degree a very valuable thing to have. That's an attitudinal change. And we cannot create the right coursework for attitudinal change. What you're doing here, again, creating a consortium, and bring your parents in, Bring that community in. Corporate involvement and education involvement in community development is absolutely critical. It doesn't work without it. We used to be able to say, we can do it alone. The thing is, nobody can do anything alone anymore. And NAM, sitting up in Washington, now knows that it has to get out on the road and talk to the people who are going to make, continue to keep manufacturing the engine that's driving this country. And it is unbelievable the productivity in manufacturing today and what it has been doing for all of us. But we have some serious work to work on. We would like to work with you on that. The Center for Workforce Success is a two-year-old endeavor of the, uh, of the NAM. Uh, I'm proud to uh, staff it and uh, have gotten it off the ground. We're only an office and a telephone without people like you. Helping us learn what's happening in the country so that we can share it with everybody else. That you're going to Sinclair uh, Community College, I did hear that. I've been out there, it's very unique, but it's only unique in what they do. Each of us has to make our own situation. Unique to our region, to the things that we do to the industries. This is an industry-rich area. It's very impressive. 
But you're right, industry will only go to where the employers, I used to work for Mack Trucks many years ago, seems like everything I did was many years ago, and I was taller then too, uh, was, and they decided to move down to Winsboro, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, excuse me, and I, uh, they went down, and they almost destroyed themselves. I went down, there was no workforce. And they uh, did a deal with the state for, at that time, it was a lot of money, $7 million worth of training. Didn't work. The population itself wasn't even ready for that. And it almost destroyed Mac. And in fact, over a period of years, they had been bought out by Renault, and they were 100% owned by Renault. And that was a sad story along the way. But in those days, in the mid-'80s, Education really wasn't thought about as an issue, as an economic necessity. So when I hear to see the CEOs in our companies, as they're increasingly doing, looking at their local education and what's happening to it, as much as they're looking at their stock quotes, we know we're on our way. And I believe we are, and I hope we can work together in this partnership. It's very exciting. I think you've done an extraordinary job. I do want to tout the little product, and I brought a few of them, but I don't have um, uh, enough for everybody. It's a new uh, booklet we put out of our center called The Skills Gap. And I think in an intelligent and clear way, in a survey of 4,500 uh, 4, of our members, it tells what manufacturers are actually thinking. They said that community colleges are the number one choice of provider for themselves as uh, for educational services. Number one. No small thing. Take advantage of that. And I'll leave some of these and I'll leave some flyers so you can order thousands of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Thank you.